I'm here uh, with award-winning journalist and number one New York Times best-selling author, Don Lemon, founder and publisher... <laughs> Founder and publisher of Courier, Tara McGowan. And NYU journalism professor, Jay Rosen. Um, so we're here to talk about, I think, one of the most over-discussed, but still uh, least understood aspects of the Trump phenomenon, which is media coverage. Um, I wanted to actually start somewhere, at least for me, maybe uncharacteristically positive, uh, or at least maybe positive. Um, we're now at the start of the third consecutive presidential election featuring Donald Trump. Uh, what do you think the press has learned about how to cover him over the past eight years? Uh, and what do you think is still left to learn? Don, I was wondering if we could start with you. I can say again. What, yes. What, what, do you do you, think? what do you think the press has learned? So we, it's, we're now in our third presidential cycle. I think in 2015, things were, were still rather naive, maybe, but maybe not so much anymore. Well, I, obviously, I think we, the press has learned a lot and then um, sometimes tend to forget what they've learned, and it's normal. People do that. Um, but I think they've learned that you have to fact-check Donald Trump in real time. Um, yeah. <clears throat> The trickiest part is live for television. I mean, you, you know, if you're in the print media, it's easier to do that. But if you're, especially in television, live television, it's tough to fact check someone in real time. But one has to do it. And um, I remember watching, um, I think it was Joe Scarborough. And the, this is when Donald Trump was president. And he was speaking, and in real time, Donald Trump would say something. And Joe Biden, I mean, and Joe Biden, and Joe Scarborough would say, well, that's actually not true. You know, they would he'd come in on his mic and say, that's actually not true. This is true, da 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 Then we'd go back to Donald Trump Live. And then he'd say well, another thing that wasn't true, and he'd say, well, that's not true because back, you know, in 2015, such and such happened, and then they'd go back to Donald Trump. So I think what um, we've learned that, but we've also learned that Donald Trump is like none of, no other candidate. And so you have got to fight the fire with the fire. And so you need your smartest, most senior, aggressive anchor or reporter covering him so that they can meet him with the same energy that he puts out. Jay, you and I have talked about this at length before, but I'm yeah. curious what your thoughts. Well, there's a lot of things they learned, and I think you're right to say we have to start with those. Um, they learned to use the word lie in their coverage. That's, that was good. Um, they learned not to wait at the podium for Trump to come on stage. Uh, they learned that, um, sure, their companies make a lot of money off the tempest that surrounds him, uh, but that can't be the guide to good coverage. Uh, and I think they learned that just like who this guy is in a, in a deep sense, just seeing patterns repeated over and over again. What they didn't learn um, begins with something that Jonathan Carl explained about two years ago with Brian Stelter, where he said, look, on air, he said, uh, he's gonna run again, and we are not prepared. He's gonna be running against the system in which he is also trying to win, he's going to be lying constantly, a simple interview melts down in minutes, what is a debate with Donald Trump in it? We don't know the answer to any of those questions. And this was two years ago. So I think the mainstream press had an opportunity to take the, those words from Jonathan Carl, who was a, a consensus figure in the press. I mean, he's a former pres uh, president of the White House Correspondents Association, he's the chief White House correspondent of ABC's News. This is not a radical. This is somebody from within the system saying, we are not ready for this. What they could have done is said, this is a challenge to our routines, to all of our sort of foundational concepts. This is an election unlike any other election, and we have to ourselves redesign our coverage. But they didn't do any of that. Um, and instead, they're pretty much going into this next campaign with the same tools that they have always used, even knowing that they're broken. Saying that we have to cover, we're gonna cover Donald Trump the same way we cover, cover exactly. any other candidate, and that's, 
That's not that's a non-starter. That's a non-starter. Yeah. And if 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 I may, Donald Trump, no candidate, no one has a right to the airwaves. No one has a right to your newspaper. No one has a right to your magazine. It's a privilege yeah. to be able to speak to the American people directly through any um, through through right through any media. And so you get to cover whoever you want, the way you want to cover them. And if you have someone who is a liar, by the way, I was one of the first, if not, to say that Donald Trump is a liar. I also said he, I opened my show one night and said, the President of the United States is racist. And everyone went, <gasps> and then now, does that shock anyone? No, because it's the truth. So you have to cover with the truth. You have to, as Jay said, you've got to call a lie a lie. You've got to you know, say if someone is a racist. You've got to say uh, if, if someone is liable for sexual assault, you must say all of those things and call them what they are and not try to you know, say, oh, well, he has a problem with the truth. Or, you know, he's, he, you know, he says some things that are sexist. No, you, you say what it is. You call it a spade a spade. And can I offer, I think part of the reason that mainstream media doesn't do that is because they need Trump more than Trump needs them now. Yeah. And I think that it is, that's something that we have to pay a lot more attention to because cable news has absolutely plummeting numbers right now. The vast majority of Americans do not watch cable news in this country. Um, I think in September, CNN had just half a million viewers. That's it, half a million. And so we, when we talk about how the media covers Trump, I think we're talking about a very small media that talks to a very small, highly educated, highly informed population. And I think the bigger issue is that there is not the same kind of coverage happening, one, where there is no local or state news that's kind of covering these elections. But more importantly, most of the information reaching most voters is reaching them passively online for free. Um, and obviously the right wing media is vast and they are much more prevalent online with free information than traditional or good information that's tucked behind paywalls. Right on. And, and Trump realizes this and he knows that they're going, to, they're going to take his terms for any interview on cable news because they want to have him there because they know they're going to get more viewers and attention. And he weaponizes that to his advantage. You're never going to get a good interview where the journalist comes out looking great with Trump. I just don't think that's possible you can. anymore. I do think it is possible. I do think that Brett Baer did a great job with President Trump that's by right. you, and he called, saying calling out the lies and the you know, misconceptions in real time. I thought Brett Baer of Fox News yep. was And Jonathan Swans was actually not bad either, and there's a common denominator there. Th that what? Say what? Jonathan Swans wasn't oh, yeah. bad either. Yeah. When you put a woman reporter in front of him, it goes a little bit differently, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really important to realize that, that Trump knows how to talk to his base. He knows how to communicate. He knows how to leverage the media to his advantage when he does. And the last thing I would say is that the media, if you think about the amount of articles, the amount of stories, the amount of tweets, the amount of everything about Joe Biden's age, and sure, Trump's indictments, but Trump has started to escalate his violent rhetoric. He has called for the execution of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He has called for physical attacks. We also know that his calls for violence lead to violence, like we saw at the insurrection. And I don't think that the media is taking that as seriously as they need to. Um, and, as, and it is something that most people don't want. They don't want violence. They don't want someone inciting violence. His base responds well to it, but they also respond seriously to it. And I think the media has an, a responsibility to attach his words to him at every turn and make sure that their audiences know that, whether or not he does an interview. The problem, yeah, though, when you, said, when you talked about cable news, the problem is, is that those clips still get sent everywhere, that they're on the, the late night shows, they're, they pick them up online or what have you. So the you know, traditional linear television numbers may be declining, but it's still seen as a source and people, those clips get spread around because of the internet. Yeah, I wanna pick up on one thing that Tara pointed out as well too, which is this, what I think of as a kind of split screen problem or a growing split screen problem in media coverage in which uh, Trump scandals are balanced out essentially by this, in my opinion, quite self-evidently bogus impeachment inquiry against Joe Biden, but also the sort of wave of Hunter Biden scandals, plus Biden's own declining poll numbers, concerns about his age, et cetera, in which you see 
a situation in which a Republican presidential front runner who has been indicted four times, will be on trial at least five times this year, is then put next to Joe Biden. And these things are essentially equivocated, that voters are concerned about Joe Biden's age, but they're also concerned about Trump's you know, potential criminal convictions. Uh, and this you know, reminds me in some uncomfortable ways of coverage of the 2016 election, particularly the Hillary Clinton email scandal, which I think was used by some mainstream outlets who are nervous about uh, about seeming biased, right? That if you had concerns about Trump, then you could throw in in paragraph eight or nine something about Hillary Clinton's email scandal. Um, and I think that what I'm seeing, at least in this election, is uh, the sense that we haven't actually learned the lessons about this kind of both sides coverage there. And I was wondering what you all think about this sort of coverage of, of Biden in regards to Trump, but also if we're sort of um, slouching back towards, towards uncomfortable uh, aspects of the 2016 Can I election. Respond to that. This is what I meant by um, not paying attention to Jonathan Carl's warning. Um, the the um, balance uh, imperative and the idea of two normal parties with the journalists standing in the middle, kind of setting, calling balls and strikes, setting the rules. There's a deep attraction to that image of the political sphere as two normal parties with the press in the middle. And the challenge to the American journalist was to replace that with a different image in which um, the people who still accept the norms of democracy, Democrats and Republicans, are facing us against the MAGA movement and the Trump movement and re kind of like reimagine the political space so that it reflects reality better and it can be covered as real better. And that kind of reconstruction of their own precedent, which is what I call it, that's what never happened. So you have more cynicism about Trump, you have more knowledge of what he's likely to do, but the deep ideas that are, uh, that are still informing the press about its own role haven't changed at all. Um, if we asked journalists three elections ago, what's your goal for your campaign coverage? They would say, we're going to cover the campaign. <laughs> That's our goal. And, and they would still say that. And it's just not good enough. It's not enough for the, the, the situation we find ourselves in. I'd, I'd love to weigh in here because I, so a Courier that uh, I started is a left-leaning newsroom. We're explicitly pro-democracy and we've leaned very heavily into that, which can be a controversial thing in traditional media circles. Um, but ideological and progressive media has been the most important media in terms of driving social movements and social change in this country. Um, and a big reason that we started Courier was because of the media's failures to essentially cover politics and elections and government in a way that is accessible to most people. And I think what gets lost sometimes in this conversation about both sidesism and false equivalency is that it's rooted in this belief, and I went to journalism school where Jay teaches, um, right next door at NYU, um, in, in the objective of giving equal time to both sides of an argument or both parties um, that are in a contest for political elections. And you can give equal time to both and talk about what Joe Biden and his administration have done for Americans, passing more bipartisan legislation than any president or administration in my lifetime, and give equal time to everything that Trump did and didn't do as president and what he says. And instead, what ends up happening is this need to say something negative about both if there's something negative to report. And so I think that we can still have both sides or objectivity in terms of fairness in reporting, as long as you're reporting the facts and understanding what, are the what is the most important information for voters to have when they cast their ballot about these candidates, who they are and what they've done and what they're promising to do. And that's just not where our media focuses. So, so um, mine is very simple. I, I, I think that the press has to remember, keep foremost in mind, which I would do every night I went on my show, is to remember that we're in the First Amendment of the Constitution. And our biggest duty is to uphold democracy so that we can earn 
the right to be in the First Amendment of the Constitution, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, right, freedom of expression. <clears throat> I think in, the, uh, in your question where you, you said, you know, journalists um, don't want to seem biased, I think that journalists should want to, rather than that, they should want to um, be responsible. Because it's, it's, it would be irresponsible not to point out that someone incited an insurrection. That's not bias, that's the truth. It would be irresponsible um, to not point out someone you know, calling people sons of bitches, black basketball players. It would be irresponsible not to do those things. That's not being biased. That's simply telling the truth. And, and it is your responsibility to give the American people, the electorate, the truth regardless of how tough that is. And sometimes you, you've got to you know, get in people's faces. And the, 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 I think what we miss a little bit here is that we, we constantly talk about Donald Trump, but it's all the surrogates who come on after and spin. And so you have to treat them with the same energy as well. You have to, and you, I don't think that election deniers should be given air, air time. I don't think that people, <laughs> who come on your air and intentionally lie to you should be given airtime. It's not a right, it's a privilege to come on. And if you come on, you should be responsible enough to tell the truth to the American people and not spin bullshit. Yeah, you raised an interesting question there as well, which is that the sort of mechanisms of mainstream press coverage normalize a lot of this, right? Because you have people that come on and, and spin, right? Spinning has been part of, well, it's been part of the American press for a very long time. But, um, but in this instance, as you rightly point out, we're talking about election denialism, we're talking about multiple uh, criminal charges. Uh, and yet we're also talking about someone who is uh, far and away the front runner to become the next Republican presidential nominee. He is uh, leading the race to such an extent that it seems at this point, you know, if there isn't some sort of uh, outside circumstance that he will be the next presidential nominee. Uh, and we are in a strange primary in which it's not particularly competitive. My own read on it is that most of the candidates are hanging around waiting for some act of God or act of a judge to happen to sort of clear the lane for them. And I think, I'm partly asking this because I don't know the answer as well, and I've been thinking about it a lot in my own coverage, but how does the press cover a non-competitive Republican primary that is being led by someone facing multiple criminal charges? Uh, that is different than 2020. It's, We're gonna learn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think I'm trying to figure it out, and I, and I genuinely don't know. Yeah, I think, I think the answer to that is use the opportunity to portray the Republican Party for what it actually is. It, it, that, that, he said it all. It's someone who's supporting in, in someone who incited an insurrection. It's someone who, the, the party, they're supporting someone who lies a lot. Um, someone who attacks institutions constantly. If the fact that um, Hillary Clinton is under investigation, it means that she's, you know, guilty. But the fact that he's under investigation means that the FBI is corrupt or you know, law enforcement agencies are corrupt or DAs are corrupt. But by the same token, remember what he said from the 2016 campaign. She's guilty, she's guilty, she's guilty, she's guilty. No due process. But when it comes to Donald Trump, due process. The press is out to get me. The, you know, Fannie Willis is out to get me. They're all out to get him. He's not guilty but Hillary Clinton was guilty. Like, you've got to point out those things. And, and, and you have to point them out to him and his surrogates. What, what is the difference? And I bet they won't, they won't know a difference. The difference will be, well, he's Donald Trump. Yeah. One of the other things that's in, that interests me about this election is that if you look at 2016, I think Trump very effectively both used right-wing media as a cover for a lot of the questions and scandals about him, but also sort of ran against the mainstream media as a surrogate for the quote-unquote establishment. 
Um, but we're, we're in a very different media environment in 2024 or 2023 than we were in 2015 and 2016. I think we've hinted at some of that with the sort of, I think cable news, as Don pointed out, retains its influence, but uh, it is diminishing, that influence is diminishing. And you're also seeing the rise of alternative media, social media, and I think the candidates themselves are making more plays, Donald Trump in particular, towards podcast hosts, some of which are quite fringe figures. And that makes, I think, covering media coverage of this election quite complicated, but it also makes understanding how these outlets um, interact with the electorate in a very interesting way. And I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how the shifting media environment is going to play a role in the 2024 election, because it seems very, very different to me than it did even just three years ago. Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. The media is incredibly decentralized right now, and that is hard for traditional mainstream media to actually wrap their heads around and understand, and I kind of equate it to, to polling, too. <laughs> they're gonna keep you know, saying the things that they're gonna say, using the information that they have, whether it's accurate or not. It's, it's, in, it's increasingly out of touch with most of the American people and where and how they get their information. And I do think that Trump and the Republican Party and a lot of the MAGA extremists really understand how to placate their base, how to feed their base. They have their own channels. They have their own spaces that are, frankly, not being monitored by other media enough and to our peril, because that's how you really get your hand on the pulse of how powerful he is. And honestly, we don't know how powerful Trump is among the voting electorate. That none of us know that. We know how powerful he is at hijacking his party and controlling it because of his base. And he's not, obviously, no one's competing with him in the polls, and I don't think that they're going to. I used to say for a while I thought DeSantis really had a shot with his war chest and Leonard Leo behind him, and he shot himself in the foot too many times, I think. I think it's going to be Trump. I think everybody's pretty resigned about that. And I've been working against Trump since 2015, and I'm the last person who wants to hear about him every day. But we do, we need to engage all sorts of media in all different places, all different personalities. Social influencers are the new advertisers and the new talking heads on TikTok and Instagram. These are the folks that have influence over the voters who need to show up in order for him to lose. Because what really scares me right now is that we don't have the imminent threat of getting him out that we had in 2020. What we do have, though, is 17 million new Gen Z eligible voters than we had in 2020. But they have to come out, and they are not watching cable news, and no offense to anyone in this room, but they're not reading TNR. <laughs> they are, and, and they're getting their information for free on social media, and that's where we meet them at Courier, and that's, that's honestly, it's hard to understand where the conversation is, reaching different enclaves of voters, but that's the only really way to get your hand on the pulse is to meet people where they are, make sure that you're leveraging trusted messengers to do that, and we just all need to get out of our own echo chambers because it's really dangerous. We know what happens when we stay just talking to each other and listening to each other, and that's not where the voters who are gonna decide the election are. Can, can I just say something? Listen, I, I, I wanna make it very clear because I'm sure people are gonna report on this and it will be reported on in conservative media. Um, one can, I'm not against Trump or for Biden, right? What I am against is lies. What I am for is truth. I'm not against Trump. I'm against the lies. Trump just happens to be the vessel that lies all the time. So I, I, I am critical of Joe Biden. I am critical of Democrats. I am critical of the Biden administration when it warrants it. And I am critical of the former president because he lies, because he incited an insurrection, because he attacks institutions because he is a threat to democracy. I'm, as a person, I don't really have a relationship with him. I don't care, I don't hate him, I'm not against him. I'm against his lies and, as you said, co-opting a, a Republican party. I think the country needs a strong Republican party and a strong Democratic party. And so, you know, I just, I wanna make that clear. You can not have a personal feeling about someone, but don't like what they do. Yeah. And, that he, and he lies a lot. That's it. We're, um, we're running out of time, but I just wanted to briefly ask the three of you, as we look ahead towards 
the 2024 election. Just briefly, if you could say what you think the most important thing facing the media is as we cover an election that will most likely be the third consecutive one featuring Donald Trump as a Republican nominee. I'll start uh, recognizing that they aren't the gatekeepers anymore. They don't have the same power to affect the election that they once had and recognizing that a lot of people in the electorate aren't listening, I would like to see the mainstream press take the opportunity to become more explicitly and aggressively pro-democracy, right. pro-participation in politics, <laughs> pro-voting, which means pro-voting for Democrats and Republicans and independents, and with these new declarations, figure out themselves the consequences for practice if they are, in fact, adopting those uh, values as their own. And that move towards pro-democracy has been slowed or held up by journalists who listen to it and say, oh, so you mean pro-Biden? Uh, no, that's not what we mean, right. as you just said. Right. That's I, as the, the challenge that I see as before the press today. Um, everything that Jay said, but one very specific thing is I wish that media would put democracy and their responsibility to informing the public, right. all the public, not just their paying subscribers or their small number of cable news watchers ahead of their business interests. Because something we didn't get to on this panel is the reason that the media is as bad as it is, the reason that they're as obsessed with Trump as it is, is because it makes them money. And, and we have to understand that a lot of news organizations have not evolved to meet people where they are on social media platforms because they don't have a way of monetizing that. That is why they have not evolved. So we have to have new models and we have to have them take their paywalls down of important critical information that reaches voters. We need them to report in a way that people talk and understand the issues in their lives. They don't want to hear about pay-fors or horse race politics. They want to understand where a candidate stands on gun control because they're worried about their kids going to school or where a candidate stands on job creation or the economy. And that's not how political reporting is done. So I think they need to start centering the American people in their work and in their journalism and not their business interests. Tara, you're amazing. <laughs> You are amazing. Thanks, Don. You're, you're speaking my language. Everything you said, and that's what I've thought about over the, the last few years, is that we need an aggressive, in-your-face media. And unfortunately, me media has become a business. It shouldn't be a business, but it is. That's the reality of it, and I get it. So you need aggressive um, reporting and journalists, and journalists who are not concerned about what are the stakeholders or the stockholders in my company, the owners of my company going to think if I go, at, you know, if, if I confront this person? Journalists should never have to think about that. What's the boss going to say if I, you know, if I confront this person or if I say something instead of the fake balance? Like, oh, but, oh well, if, if, if you say something negative about a, a, a Republican or a Donald Trump, then you have to say something negative about a Democrat. It does it, it shouldn't work that way, but that's the way it, that's the way it works. Because, because as journalists, we wanna say, well, it should be equal and everything should be equal. We're not in normal times. This is not, you know, Kemp Republicanism. This is a Donald Trump, this is not a Mitt Romney Republicanism. Look at what's happening in Congress right now. We don't have, a, a, you know, a Speaker of the House. So we're not in normal times. So when you're not in normal times, you have to act maybe sometimes not normally. You have to adapt to whatever it is that you're in, whatever era that you're in. We're in a very dangerous era right now, and I do believe that democracy is on the line. And we see, we can see what's happening in the news now when democracy fails. I think that's a perfect note to end on. And I uh, just wanted to thank the panelists and uh, thank all of you. Thanks.